Well, hello everyone. I'm going to take a little bit different approach uh, to this video. Uh, most of all of my videos are about castings and this video is about what I do with the castings. So the previous video that you may have seen was uh, me uh, making this uh, intake manifold for this system. And uh, what this video is about is what I have to do once I have the raw casting to actually build it into a, a working running system. So uh, that's where we're going to go from here. But I've, I take uh, a lot of people ask me why I put so much effort into building these induction systems and, and why inline carbs. And I guess it's kind of the intersection of my hobby interest and it lets me use a lot of the skills I've developed over the years. Uh, in the course of such a project, you have to do a lot of problem solving, which can require some creativity. And... I guess some people do crossword puzzles and among other things, I build automotive induction systems that have vintage uh, racing themes on them. So um, that's what I do. I guess it's really just the way I'm wired. But uh, besides a general interest in motorsport and a special interest in inline carbs, I like to build working systems because I'd much prefer they be used as intended on a running car rather than being relegated to the shelf of some collection. So. Um, besides getting to use uh, as many skills as I can uh, these days, maybe maybe I'm learning at least as much as I forget because the, the things I've recently learned I have to touch more often like CAD and CAM, for example, or I, I forget them. But uh, the things that I learned long ago, like how to single point a thread on a lathe, you know, I guess I never forget those, but I guess that's just uh, the aging process. But uh, the intake manifold is the foundation for building such a system. Without that, you've just got a handful of smoke. You saw how that uh, casting came into the world in the first video. Uh, there was a lot of armchair designing and CAD CAM work before the shop phase of the project started. Um, and I utilized that, that uh, for work throughout the course of the build. But uh, even so, making a one-off casting, um, after you've got that done, you're still a heck of a long way from a running system. So... In this video, I go into some of what it takes to build a complete system besides uh, metal casting. There's a lot of other things I do all within my shop in the course of building a complete and ready to run system. So we can have a look at it, but before we do, um, just a couple general things. This is an independent runner um, intake manifold that uses uh, two um, uh, inline auto light carbs, the larger B carb version, and it's a 92 deck uh, 351 Cleveland um, that goes into a Pantera. And Pantera, of course, is mid-engine car, so the front of the car is that way. And uh, there's a lot of unique features on it that I'll go to, into during the course of the video. But one of them was um, the customer wanted the, uh, the air filters to be parallel to one another. And as you know, the, the, uh, the banks on a small block Ford are offset by about the width of a connecting rod. So um, to do that, I just offset the... Uh, the runners half that distance so it uses identical air filters and and really it's really no compromise at all to the to the runner on that but outside of that there's a number of unique things in the uh the valley and the vacuum plenum that i'll go into in the video but the first thing that it takes is you got to be able to machine that uh, raw intake manifold casting into something that can bolt to an engine so I suppose as the next steps here, let's take a look at some of the things that I've uh, done to be able to uh, enable myself to do that. So stand by. Just thought I'd show you guys my machining fixture. I got it set up on my knee mill here, but I built this, um, oh, a few years ago for machining intakes and chewing them and decking them and so on. But, uh, Basically, there's a, a plate that I mount to the carburetor flanges, and then I mount the plate to the fixture. And the fixture is mounted in a rotary table, as you see there at the end on one end, and you know an angle plate on the other. And uh, I didn't build uh, <clears throat> locks into the right end, so I just, uh, after I um, rotated in the rotary table, I just clamp it in place when I do the machining there. But uh, <clears throat> I... Uh, I use a CAD program and I can calculate the uh, three space coordinates for all the, the mounting holes and I just rotate the uh, rotary table to the right angle and then send the XY table to those coordinates and uh, go ahead and drill all the holes from the back side. And I can also do the milling um, to the proper thicknesses on the flanges and whatnot. So uh, that's probably the trickiest part, getting um, one, getting the fixture um, set up and indicated in properly and then getting the uh the intake manifold uh, mounted and indicated in properly but uh, i built some aids 
and little uh, tricks into the fixture to help me do that. So uh, I'm ready to get machining on it and finish this one up. I'll see you shortly. Hello everyone, back with you. Um, you saw my, well, the brief excerpt on the uh, machining fixture I built for the uh, intake manifolds and uh, I thought I'd talk just a little bit more um, about machining because after the uh, first uh, part video um, that produced the casting, you know, when, when all you got is a raw casting, you're still a pretty long ways away from something you, you can bolt onto an engine and you got quite a bit of machining to do. Well, that fixture takes care um, of most of the interface uh, machining, namely uh, the locations of all the mounting holes and the, and the, the uh, mounting flange surfaces and, and whatnot. But I thought I'd talk about um, some of the other work, uh, machine work, uh, that goes into actually making it a manifold and making the other parts to the system. Um, this particular manifold, uh, as you know from the uh, pattern, it's got um, a vacuum plenum and it's got quite a few ports here for vacuum accessory and um, for adding oil. Um, this particular customer, he wanted uh, three or four things um, included in that vacuum plenum. One of them was he wanted to be able to fill oil um, to the engine um, through the valley. And that takes some doing because you've got to penetrate um, the vacuum plenum and maintain a seal. So that's what this port is right here. And I'll show you the underside uh, in a minute, but this is the oil fill port. And um, to do that, um, I actually, uh, um, I made him uh, an oil fill cap here out of brass and single pointed that thread on my lathe and machined the O-ring groove into it. And then to do the uh, mating port for it here, um, as opposed to single pointing the thread because uh, I, Figured that's a good way for me to scrap the manifold. I'm just not a good enough machinist to be confident enough to single point that in um, on, on my mill. And uh, so um, I got a uh, $25 special uh, one and a quarter inch number 12 uh, tap, which is pretty damn good tap for 25 bucks delivered. Um, it's a bottoming tap with six flutes, but it, uh, it did the job very nicely. And then I did um, single point the uh, the O-ring gland for it in the chamfer in there with my boring head. So when you're done, uh, the oil cap, of course, got an O-ring seal on it, and uh, it just screws in there like that. So a couple of the other things here is um, the ports that I use for vacuum ports, um, they're not pipe thread fittings, um, they're port fittings. And port fittings um, are like here, you see, they've got a straight thread and an O-ring on them and they screw into a straight threaded port with a gland for that o-ring and they're most typically like a flared fitting on the other side but they could be anything but a long time ago i invested in, uh, in a set of port cutting tools for that and this this particular um, set that i have um, is a, a radial drive um, i think met cut popularized that but i've got a series of these uh, different size port cutters that does the pilot for the uh, for the threaded hole and all the features um, for the o-ring gland 
and uh, these uh, radial drives are kind of nice. So uh, anyway, that kind of speeds things up and uh, that's what I use to do the uh, three port fittings and then the uh, straight port fitting with the O-ring just uh, screws into those and they seat and locate positively and seal positively um, with the, uh, the O-ring. So those are pretty nice. And then the last thing uh, this customer wanted is he wanted um, positive crankcase ventilation. And uh, I tried to talk him out of that three times because I just don't think it belongs on um, an intake manifold and performance engine like this, but he was dead set on having it. And this is what he provided me for it. And he wanted it to push in with a grommet. Um, so that's what this port here is, is it receives that grommet and that uh, PCV valve pushes right into it. And then it gets its vacuum from one of these ports here. So um, anyway, that's uh, besides the carb flanges and the mounting holes, um, that's all what's going on on top of the manifold um, for that. Now, if we turn it over, um, look at the underside, you can see uh, that's um, it's got a lot going on there too. So um, these these three holes here actually go through the uh, the valley or the plenum plate that does all the sealing here. And they get additional seals um, because they actually penetrate into the engine crank case and all the rest of the features on the plate I'll show you in a minute here, um, this seal the vacuum from the outside world. But uh, you probably saw on the uh, video footage leading up to this, I actually did this machining here on my CNC router and I got to tell you, I had about 30 PSI of butt pucker while that was going on because that's asking, that's asking a lot um, out of that little machine. But uh, I took uh, very light cuts and uh, I have to say, I mean, you can't, it's hard for you to tell because I used a quarter inch end mill. So there, there's a lot of witness marks that you see, but the finish is actually pretty darn good. Um, I'm really surprised uh, at how good a job uh, it did on that but uh, you can see it's a pretty complex shape and then um, these little mouse holes right here um, are what allow all the cavities underneath there these are the strengthening ribs and I put those in the pattern for strength and I left them in there until the very last operation and then I put these little mouse holes in there because that's how all the plenums talk to one another um, on that so uh, if we take a look at the mating plate here <coughs> So I also did this on that CNC router, and you can see it's got a gland all the way around the outside. Um, I use O-ring cord stock and splice it together, and that's how I make that big O-ring for out there. Um, every one of the screw holes just gets a round O-ring like this uh, that pops into each one of the screw holes. And uh, since the, the uh, pressure uh, difference is from the outside world in, uh, these, these uh, all the screw uh, glands actually seal on the OD of these little counter bores, not on the threaded screw. And the same thing with these, the, the, the outside pressure of the world is here and the vacuum's here. So everything is from the outside of these holes um, in. So when you design those O-ring glands, you design the O-ring to fit on the side of the hole um, that's low pressure on that. And you can see I've got um, the O-ring sitting in that gland right there. So anyway, when you, when you flip that over, um, it actually goes like this, like so. Um, it lands with all those O-rings on all those holes. And then there's a screw um, that goes, of course, in each hole. And these are uh, these little Allen head screws. I don't know if you can see it or not, but uh, they're actually drilled so they get safety wired um, to one another since they're exposed to the inside uh, of the engine. So uh, anyway, that's, um, these are the three ports that penetrate into the valley, as you can see, and they're all O-ring sealed uh, too. So I can hold it up so you can, you can see those there. So uh, yeah, that's a fair amount of machining. There's one other thing too that I almost forgot about. Here, I'll take this out. Uh, even though I don't really like that PCV valve, I just kind of got on board. So I machined uh, this little baffle here. Um, there's a... You can see there's a perforated plate. I got some uh, stainless steel mesh in there. Um, there's another perforated plate that goes on top like so. 
And the only thing that's not in there yet is I haven't machined in the snap ring groove. I'm still waiting on the, the uh, snap ring. I had a hardware order from McMaster. I got comments coming. But that, that snap ring will go in there, and it will be a self-contained module. And uh, it just drops in uh, to uh, that port there um, where the uh, um, PCV valve is. And then it's held captive in there by the, uh, the valley plate. So that baffle just... Uh, is intended to uh, knock out oil droplets and maybe condense a little bit of the vapor before um, it it hits and sees the uh, PCV valve. But uh, so outside of that, um, you can see there's there's a lot going on there. Um, I probably have as much work into designing that plenum and and all the ceiling and features and so on as I do uh, you know finishing up the rest of the intake. So uh, anyhow. Um, that's about uh, it. We're getting pretty darn close to my favorite part of the whole project, and that's final assembly. So uh, stay tuned for that. So I used to uh, outsource uh, my plating, but the problem with it was uh, they always charged me a lot charge of between $80 and $150, and uh, they weren't very reliable, and quite frankly, they probably weren't very impressed with me, and I surely wasn't very impressed with them. And then when I had, uh, I think it was eight or 10 carburetors worth of, uh, of parts in their hands, they phoned me up and told me they'd misplaced them and couldn't find them. And you can imagine, you know, 10 antique carburetors are worth two or $3,000 a piece. That wasn't a very reassuring thought. But uh, they did eventually find them. But basically I said enough of that and started doing my own plating. So it's just uh, zinc plating. It's not hard to do. Um, you can buy kits from companies like Caswell, or you can just uh, look it up on the internet. And it's uh, you basically need um, some electrolyte, um, some weak acids, and uh, a, a decent power supply helps a lot too. And like most things, um, uh, the preparation of the parts makes a big difference um, for plating. But what we're trying to do here is, is I make automotive parts. I don't make Rembrandts, but... Um, you know, these parts here on the left are pretty typical of the condition that I get them in. They look pretty nasty on that. And uh, I strip them in a hydrochloric acid solution um, and then put them through the plating process. I'm about to show you, and they come out looking like these, which look a lot nicer um, than that, obviously. But what I'm going for is corrosion protection and uniformity of color. Um, if it was something other than zinc like chrome, you'd have to put a whole lot more effort um, into the preparation of the parts. But all I do with the parts is strip them, and then I like to give them a really fine media blast because it gives them a nice matte finish, and it kind of looks like the old um, cab plating that they were originally on. But as far as my setup, I try to keep, I do small parts, I try to keep um, the chemicals on hand to a minimum. Those are all um, one and a half or two gallon buckets um, that you see there. Um, I've got a hot plate and some degreaser that you heat in that uh, back pot. The front uh, one is just rinse. Every one of these steps in the process has its own rinse. That thing sitting in the middle there is a constant current power supply, so I can just dial in the current that I want. Uh, zinc um, wants about an amp um, per, I think is it uh, amp per square inch? I have to look it up, um, I already forgot. But um, the process is pretty simple that you see here. This is the electrolyte. Um, this thing clamped here is actually the um, an aquarium pump um, on the bottom of that, and that's circulating, giving light circulation um, to the electrolyte. There's um, two zinc anodes here that are connected, and the uh, anode um, gets the positive source um, from the power supply, and then the cathode, which you hang the parts on, uh, gets the uh, the negative source, and uh, the electroplating process dissolves the zinc off the anode and attracts it to the cathode, and the cathode is the parts that we're plating. And then I mentioned uh, each uh, process has its own rinse. That's what these buckets in front of are, just distilled water. Um, this one here that I've got the parts in, a couple parts in, is just a really light, it's a 5% hydrochloric acid solution to etch the parts. Um, I etch them, then I degrease them, um, then I give them a light etch um, again, and into the electrolyte they go. They get plated. And then um, between the rinses, the final step is here. And um, this is a, a chromate. 
Um, I use yellow chromate, so it comes out looking like the CAD color on that, but that's how I get the parts plated, and I don't have to put up with uh, vendors, and they don't have to put up with me. I don't worry about lot size. I just do what I need to do, and I get decent-looking parts that have good corrosion protection on them. As far as the chemicals, the degreaser is benign. That's any degreaser you can naturally use. The electrolyte, I mean, you can use white vinegar. Um, I use a solution that, that uh, I think works a little bit better than that. The, the hydrochloric acid solution is pretty darn benign. You can just dilute that and, uh, and you can put it down the drain um, on that. The only thing you probably need to treat with a little bit more respect um, is the chromate. Um, it's fairly dilute and, you know, it got, um, hexavalent chromium got a lot of press and Aaron Brockovich, but drinking it for 30 years versus just having a gallon and a half of it in your shop are two completely different things. But, uh, that's pretty much it for my plating setup. And I also, you don't see it here, but I built myself a little barrel plater that also fits in that electrolyte bucket. So all the little dinky things like, uh, the unique hardware, idle screws and stuff like that. I just throw in that little barrel tumbler and I plate those in bulk. So uh, that's the plating process. Back with you soon. Well, all the uh, carburetor cleaning and prep and repair work is done and it's time for reassembly. Um, I got a number of trick parts that I put into the carburetors, but uh, when I get them back together, they're better than they ever were new. So. We'll put these back together and have a look at uh, what the outcome is. Stay tuned. All right, everyone, I'm back and it's my absolutely favorite part of the process and that's final assembly. So first thing I'm gonna do here is button up the vacuum plenum. A um, Couple of things. I did finish up this little baffle uh, that I made here. It's got some, um, I guess they call it scrubble. It's uh, just, uh, it looks like swarf, you know, to catch uh, water or oil vapor. And uh, it's all held together in there between uh, perforated plates and a cylinder with a snap ring. And that little cartridge just uh, slips right in here to this pocket and it gets captured by the uh, valley pan when it goes on. And then the valley pan, I've got uh, all the O-rings um, installed in it. Um, that perimeter O-ring I had to splice as did this one here. The rest of them are just round O-rings. I uh, put some lube in a, in a bag and uh, squished them all around in there to lube up the O-rings thoroughly so they're, they're stuck. But uh, to put it in there, I'm gonna do this and also put one screw in here because this one here gets a little, a little tricky. Let's see if I can get that screw through there helps hold that o-ring um, in place so all right let's see if i can get it in there so i'll just set it in there like so and there we go so i'll go ahead and uh put all these uh drilled socket head cap screws uh in there i talked about those before they'll eventually get safety wired but I'll button these down and then we'll, uh, we'll move over to the top side and start getting things together there. Stay tuned. All right, everyone back with you. You see that uh, I've got some studs installed. I Loctited those in place and, and set them. And then you can probably see the uh, gaskets um, are in place there, this individual gaskets. And so it's ready to have the carbs uh, mounted on it. But before I do that, um, you can see the linkage here uh, laying on the, the table here and these brackets, these two brackets here are uh, part of the linkage and so is this one. It's actually mounts the accelerator cable and I fabricated these uh, from eighth inch uh, steel plate and uh, um, to custom fit this fellow's uh, Pantera installation. And then uh, these two, same thing here. Um, the way the linkage works is it's a counter rotating linkage. So the throttle plates, uh, they both tip in the same direction, both inward. So they're counter rotating on that. So you get absolute symmetry of flow. And then you probably noticed um, 
but uh, I made the little heim links here, bought the uh, rod ends, these two little castings I sneaked in there on you. You'll see when they're installed how this mounts uh, on some of the carb features, and then the uh, bell crank here is mounted in ball bearings, so it's got like zero backlash, so it's nice and tight, and uh, I'll show you when I get it installed. I'll probably have to take the tops of the carbs off so you can see it well, but good linkage is just really critical for independent runner systems so you can adjust and tune them. But uh, I'll get on with the install here and we'll come back and take a look at the linkage installed. All right, so first off, the, uh, as far as the linkage goes, the customer asked that I set it up to interface with the original equipment accelerator cable in the Pantera. And of course, Panteras are mid-engine cars, so this is the front of the car. And it's a little different because that means the accelerator uh, cable pulls this way, whereas in a front engine car, it'd pull the other direction. So the, the linkage had to accommodate that. But I've got one of these uh, quick release ball joints on here and just to slips right out of here. And I'll tell you what I'll do, I'll take the tops off the carburetors and we'll take a closer look at the linkage because it's a little easier to see it that way. So stand by. All right, let's have a look at what we've got here. So you see all the bits and pieces of the uh, linkage mounted up. The mount for the bell crank picks up the original accelerator lever mounts on the carburetors, these two extensions here. Um, they're inboard, in this case, the way I have it set up. And then of course the uh, bell crank mounted in bearings mounts to that. Uh, we got a little redundant return spring out here. You see down here the uh, accelerator cable bracket that I mentioned before. And then um, one thing that, um, remember on this, since a Pantera is a mid-engine car, the front of the car is that way, and that's where the accelerator uh, uh, cable comes from. So the, uh, the linkage, this here where it connects with that uh, snap-off ball joint, actually actuates this way to open the throttle. And I don't have the idle stop or wide open throttle stops adjusted perfectly or anything right now, but you get the idea here that it all actuates. You can see the accelerator pump um, arms on uh, all four of them on the carbs moving in unison with the, uh, the accelerator. So uh, yeah, I put a fair amount of effort um, into the linkage. And like I said, it's just necessary. You need to do it for IR systems like that. So I thought it was better seen with the tops of the carburetors off, so I'll put that back together and uh, maybe put the filters on and we can get kind of a final shot of that. Stay tuned. Well, all right, that pretty much brings us full circle from where we started. I bolted the filters onto it and uh, I guess I'll wrap up the video with a few uh, glamour shots of uh, still shots of the induction system, but uh, you can have a look at those. This is, uh, I think it's the first time that I ever did a video on one of the induction systems, the uh, completed induction systems that I cast manifolds for. I don't know if I'll do another one um, or not. I'll certainly be doing other induction systems on that, but most of what I do um, is about casting as far as my YouTube channel. But uh, I hope you enjoyed this one and uh, I'll leave you with some photos and uh, Please consider joining The Home Foundry if you're uh, an avid home caster. And if uh, not, and you're just into motorsport and old cars and, and whatnot, then that's great too. We'll see you around YouTube. Take care. We'll catch up next time.